uh, you know, you're just, you're there, you're waiting, you've got 10 seconds, you need to launch an app, do something, and get out of there really quick. And then finally, the lost example. So these are things that, that um, location services make possible where you can, you can pull out your phone and find out what's around you or what's been around you or what's interesting near you, what else is going on near you. Um, yeah, this is, this is a super compelling, uh, super compelling uh, application model. I think we're going to see a lot of new things happening under the, the location-based services. It's, it's funny because all the, all the location-based service does is provide your GPS coordinates to an application, which we could have done. We could be doing this, have been doing this all along if we just knew our latitude and longitude. You know, every web form could say, please provide your name your first name, your last name, your email address, and your latitude and longitude, but no one knew it. So now we just get that one, that those two little extra data points all of a sudden open up this huge realm of possibilities for location-based applications. So I like to sort of take a second to think about my home screen or suggest that you take it, uh, a second to think about your home screen in the context of Bored, Busy, and Lost and think about which apps you use the most, maybe the ones that are on your, your very first home screen, uh, and in which category those fall into, which ones you use the most, which ones you like the most, which ones that you find the most useful. Uh, I have about 20 phones, but this is one of them, and these are the apps that I keep on it. And it's, it's, I suppose it's, it was interesting to me when I really put this talk together and I looked at that because some of these apps I use all the time, like 10, 20, 30 times a day, and other ones I hardly ever use, but when I do use them, I want them to be immediately accessible. I don't want to have to look around for them. The camera in particular, I don't really use the camera that much. Maybe depends. When I'm traveling, I'll use it a lot, but on a normal day, I don't use the camera that much, but when I do use it, I want to immediately know where it is, immediately grab it, because I need to get it open fast. I need to take the picture fast, otherwise I'm going to miss it. So if I'm scrolling around looking for my camera, it's a waste to even have the camera on the phone. Same sort of thing with the actual phone application. I barely ever use it, but when, uh, you know, because AT&T is so wonderful. But uh, when I do need to use it, I usually want it right away. I don't want to have to look around for it. So uh, a good friend of mine, Josh Clark, and fellow uh, O'Reilly author, recently released a book called Tapworthy that talks about uh, a lot of these considerations, pure design considerations for mobile applications, and I highly recommend checking that out. Um, I sort of distilled a bunch of, it's a, you know, a big book, of course, and I distilled it down to a couple of things that are important to me. So when, you're dis when you have a, a mobile project and you're, you're basically just getting started, you want to highly target your audience. You want to know exactly who you're programming for. You want to know exactly which context your application is going to fall into one of those three contexts. And you want to just incredibly optimize it. You want to make it so that you can, they, the, your users can just launch fast, get their task done quickly, smoothly, and get out of there uh, when they're done. Yep. So on the last point, the do one thing and do it well, I like this graphic which is actually real. That's not a Photoshop. That's not Photoshop magic. This is called the, uh, the Wenger Giant, which has got the Guinness World Record for the most multifunctional pen knife. And so this is obviously kind of funny looking. Um, it was made for the knife company's 100th anniversary, and it has 87 tools with 141 functions, including a cigar cutter, a laser pointer, and something called a golf reamer, which I still don't know what that is. But it's sort of funny, but what's, I think, really interesting, the important takeaway from this is a pen knife becomes unusable when it's nine inches long and weighs eight pounds. You can no longer use it. It's, it's, actually, it's actually sort of, it collapses under its own weight. So, you know, if you close that up, it wouldn't even fit in your pocket. So it becomes useless because it has too many features. So this is like feature creep gone wild. So with uh, and I, I see a lot of this. I work with large corporate clients, and they all have you know, a million stakeholders. And when they get in touch with you, they say, 
like, oh, we want to build an app, and we've got, you know, the marketing department wants it to have this and that, and the sales department wants to have this, and, and you know, whatever. Operations wants it to have this, and they try and wedge too many things into an application. They, they need to really, uh, especially large organizations, get really excited about the concept of, we're going to build an iPhone app, and they forget that, that you know, maybe they should build a couple of different apps. They, don't, they forget about their user, basically, and they just want to wedge everything into it and, and make it sort of one-size-fits-all experience. It just does not work for mobile. I had one customer send me a, um, a spreadsheet of about 60 things, that features that they wanted included in the app. Store locator, Wayfinder. They even, one of the bullet points just said, a game. Like, they wanted, they didn't describe what kind of game or anything. It was just like, we w and throw a game in there while you're at it. I was like, no, we're not doing that. No one wants that. So, all right. So, moving on. And to summarize, you want to be finger friendly. So when you're building an application for a small screen device, you want chunky targets and sort of generous spacing. Even though you don't have a lot of real estate, you still want to have generous spacing. If you put buttons too close to each other, um, especially down toward the bottom, a lot of, I see this in a lot of apps, uh, where there's not enough spacing and the, the tap hits the wrong target. It's so frustrating. Um, especially if maybe the send button is right next to the backspace button and you, you know, you're like typing something up and then you go to backspace and you hit send by accident. How angry is that going to make you? That's really frustrating. So you need to be very careful about where you put stuff, make your targets big, keep a lot of space around them. Avoid scrolling if at all possible. Uh, obviously if you have me an RSS reader or something, you're going to have long lists, you're certainly going to scroll. But if you can avoid scrolling, you definitely want to do it. And this last point is the most interesting. Uh, this was really eye-opening for me. I'm a, I come from a desktop web background. And, you know, typically the navigation and the main controls are up at the top. And you just mouse up there and you navigate around the website. Or even web apps, you know. Um, but with the, with the phone, you want to put the controls at the bottom. The most used controls need to be at the bottom. Because unlike the desktop environment, you don't have a, 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 an external pointer device. Your finger is your pointer, this giant meat pointer comes down, and if your controls are at the top, you cannot see what you're doing. You've got, you're blocking everything if the controls are at the top all the time. So you want them down at the bottom. Uh, this is especially uh, useful when you consider someone using with one hand, they've got their thumb, and if you think about which hand you use your phone with, the hot spots are right down, you know, right down here at the bottom if, you're, if, if you use it in your right hand or the other bottom corner if you're left-handed. So s some apps even allow for flipping left-handed or right-handed controls so your most used controls are on one side or the other. I personally don't have a particular way that I use my phone. Uh, I ran a survey um, a few months ago to ask people how they most often use their phones, whether it was one-handed in the left, one-handed in the right, two-handed left, two-handed in the right, and there was no clear winner. It was just very, very evenly distributed. People do all different things constantly. So uh, it's the kind of thing you want to keep in mind when you're building your app. So make it Make it finger friendly. All right, so now that you've decided to build an app and you've got a design for it and you think it's awesome, you have to decide how you're going to build it. And there are a number of different architecture options that you can take, certainly popular ones these days. Uh, these days, we've got native apps, we've got web apps, and we've got SMS apps. And I'm really just going to talk about native apps and web apps, but I like to bring up SMS apps because I think they're really cool, and I think they're really useful, and I think they don't get enough attention. So native apps is just sort of a typical, um, what you get out of the app store. Traditionally, it's, uh, it's, written with, um, uh, it's written with a native framework, a proprietary framework that's specific to a platform. It's compiled down to native code, and it creates a binary that it, you then would upload into an app store of some kind or potentially distribute uh, on your own, depending on the platform. Then you've got web apps, which traditionally, from the, in the traditional sense, uh, are basically finger-optimized web pages. So you have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript running on a web browser. Someone links to it in, uh, uh, from their mobile browser on their phone, and they interact with your app over the internet. And then you have SMS apps, which are basically kind of like a command line interface, where there's no graphical user interface, but you interact with online services via over SMS, kind of like the, uh, the way Twitter initially worked and, and uh, Google 411, these kinds of things. So uh, we can 
people actually spend entire uh, weeks arguing about which one's the best, but uh, I think that it's everyone's in agreement that there's a, an Achilles heel, a major Achilles heel of each of these 